Initiate captions test one. Begin captions test two. Sweet, okay. Fingers crossed. Let's go. Hello! Welcome to an adventure. I hope you can hear me. I hope you can hear the music. Ah, I was like, I can't hear the music. <laughs> but now I can. So, <laughs> let me see who's here. Uh, Key Squared! Oh my gosh! Hi! Um, thank you so much for the resubscription. 32 months! Um... I don't think that command works here. But whatever, we got some emotes jumping around <laughs> thanks to uh, thanks to Hannah, who also just resubscribed for 37 months. Um, and let's see, what else? Uh, Key Squared with the resubscription. Uh, Consilience, hello, hello, hello. <laughs> hello to the Virginia Tech Dean of Students Office, indeed. Um, and yeah, Hannah, hi. Uh, Thank you very much for 37 months. Um, there is a little bit of an echo. Sadness abounds. Um, I am uncertain how to fix the echo at the moment. Uh, Consilience, thank you for the bit. Um, echo. That's a new one. Uh, oh. Hello? I'm gonna figure this out quickly, I hope. <clears throat> I'm at least going to attempt to figure it out quickly. Uh, microphone. I have some noise suppression. Three band equalizer and delete. Limiter. And it should have been. I could. Hmm. It could be. You know, I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> so I'll figure it out. Uh, is it really bad? Um. Also, Consilience, thank you very much for gifting a sub to Shiny Marigold. I do, and I was just... Is it an echo on the, the music or the... Um, or is it my voice? Because... That's that. Um, oh, so that does that. <laughs> um, no. I don't know. Hi, Sterling. <laughs> okay, so it's an echo on the voice. Well, grr, arg. is ah 
I think that should fix it. I hope. Is there, is there still a problem with echoiness? I'm hoping not. Because I think I identified the problem, but, you know, it's all experimental. It's only the second time I've done this setup. Yes, the echo is gone. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, it was the new tool that it's only the second time I've used. It, it, the, the stream together thing, um, I needed to mute the microphone, <laughs> the other microphone. But we got it. And there's still sound coming from the other channel, so everything is good. <laughs> Thank you. Someday. I might start one of these without having to do tons of tech. <laughs> Everything in this building is experimental. Yes, more or less. Hi, welcome back, Key Squared. It's it's good that you're able to chat now. Yay. Um. Okay. I think we should get started because there's way more today than I could ever possibly cover. Um. And uh, so I'm glad that we were able to get the audio sort of addressed. Hopefully, hopefully it's good. But uh, so much stuff. Um, yeah, we got tons today. Tons and tons. So let me um, kick us off as we normally do with a glance towards the history of where I'm physically located. Uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that mor the Morrill Land Grant College Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. Virginia Tech acknowledges that its Blacksburg campus sits partly on land that was previously the site of the Smithfield and Solitude Plantations, owned by members of the Preston family. Between the 1770s and the 1860s, the Prestons and other local white families that owned parcels of what became Virginia Tech also owned hundreds of enslaved people. We acknowledge that enslaved black people generated wealth that financed the predecessor institution to Virginia Tech, the Preston and Olin Institute, and they also worked on construction of its building. Not until 1953, however, was the first black student permitted to enroll. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to a prosim that I may serve. In the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. <laughs> um, Hannah, I'm very glad that that um, that is the case, because I anticipated that being the case. Um, but yes, there are fewer tech issues now that I'm in my office. Um, the issue we had today might have actually not occurred if I had had any time between last week's episode and this week's episode to do some testing and document what I need to have on and off, but I didn't have time. So it was just me going off of memory. <laughs> anyway, um, this week... Our adventure takes us back to the 1950s for a look at Virginia Tech Atomic Energy Laboratories, um, which otherwise could just be called the Virginia Tech Nuclear Reactors. Um, so uh, there are some photographs. There's... Um, documents. 
I actually don't know if the photos are here. If not, I mean, the, the good ones are digitized and I can, we can look at them anyway. I just, I don't know if they made it, if they got pulled, regardless. Um, I don't have a finding aid for you to look at this week. Because there's just a lot of stuff that we pulled, and a lot of it is not finding aid stuff. Uh, instead, the link in the um, finding aid announcement will take you to this blog entry on the Special Collections and University Archives blog. And I actually wrote this entry, um, so you can judge my writing, uh, my casual writing for a blog. Um, but this blog entry covers part of the history. Um, so if you want to explore it, you're welcome to. Uh, but yeah, we got we got some pictures of the, these are from the 70s, uh, of the reactor on campus. And there's like the control room. And um, so those are on the blog. Where I want to start, actually, is there's a video linked in the blog that's not in our collections, but that I want to I want to start with the video, and I will cross my fingers <laughs> that it's gonna work. Uh, I may need to make sure that it's gonna capture the sound from the browser. Um, give me one second while I double check those settings. Um, because I'll, I'll need to pause the pretzel rocks and uh, let's see Safari monitor and output okay it should work <gasps> the question I'm uncertain of is whether it will route correctly <laughs> for all the places I need it to go. It's fine. We'll figure it out. Um, pause this and check. There's always complexity in, is this going to work? Uh, and, and now I'm like, is the audio going to go through to both channels? Let me do a quick test here. I'm going to mute the music. Actually, let me do it this way. All right. Pause that. So it was not capturing that. Lovely. <laughs> Sterling! <laughs> you were randomly selected as VIP for this week. Congratulations. Um, hold one second. If I could tell it where I want the audio to route, things would be better. Oh, maybe try, let me try this. This is gonna be weird, but let me try it. Okay. Experiment in progress. Also, let me see. It's not gonna capture the full screen for you? I have sadness. 
It's fine. Yeah, it, it's way too quiet, so I'll play it again. I'm trying to monitor the other channel uh, using my phone. Um, all right, volume there. Uh, do, 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 do. Brit, that, I'm going to bump this up. All right. Here we go. Sorry, how is the volume level on that? I, I just noticed that the volume level on the other channel, not good. Third time's the charm. If, if that was good for you, it should be better on the other channel too, now that I've made an adjustment. As one of the Oak Ridge scientists here in the Oak Ridge Regional Symposium on Atomic Energy, I'm certainly happy to be here. We're having an excellent meeting uh, today and tomorrow for, for the symposium, and we've, which is being attended by like 150 or 200 people uh, from uh, industries, colleges, high schools from all over this part of Virginia and West Virginia. The program of this particular symposium uh, has to do with a, a number of very general topics, atomic energy, industrial power, use of radioactive isotopes, and this sort of thing. Uh, this is really just the start of a longer period, or short course as we're calling it, uh, which we'll go into a good deal more detail and will be um, for the representatives and college people from the various areas. I'm very happy to be here at VPI and to get a quick first look at the nuclear laboratory which we're set, being set up here. I'm off at that to have Dr. Robeson here to explain it to us. Thank you, Dr. Overman. This is our nuclear reactor simulator, which is just set up today. It contains all of the control system from a normal operating reactor. The equipment will be to train students in the techniques of reactor operation. The equipment is at the present time, and the various uh, experiments which are performed reactors can be uh, done here. This model simulates the reactor in uh, showing the control rods, the safety rods, and the, and the uh, control positioning rod here. If for any reason the reactor becomes uh, is misadjusted either intentionally or otherwise by the student instructor. The reactor automatically scrams, which means that the control rods drop suddenly and the equipment, the reactor is so there's no danger to personnel if there should be a real reactor. A scram is indicated by this type of alarm. And of course, then the student must go through the proper operation operating sequence to reset the reactor before you can bring it back up to operating power. So, yeah, that was, um, that was the video. I don't remember all the content of the video, unsurprisingly, because I have not seen it recently, but Hopefully you all got to hear it. I know they're introducing the Argonne uh, reactor, um, and we're definitely going to look at that one. Um, but it was pretty cool. I wish that the video clip was ours. It's not. 
it's from the University of Virginia's archives. Uh, but you could see it's like it's a test reactor that they're doing. So we're set, being set up here, and offered that to have Dr. Robeson here to explain it to me. Thank you, Dr. Overman. This is our nuclear reactor simulator. Yeah, this is a, a nuclear reactor today. simulator. So it contains all what of does the that mean? System from a normal operating uh, reactor. We'll definitely look at that. The equipment will be used to train students in the techniques of reactor operation. Anyway, I thought that that video would be an interesting place to start, um, even though it is not part of our archives. Uh, hopefully you all found it interesting. Let me bump this back so I can restart the music. And then this one. It'll get smoother. Just eventually. Okay. Um, so yeah, we have we have that video, and then I have a bunch of documents that we're gonna look at. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully that worked, and was not ridiculously bad. Um, some of the articles that are here, I have the originals here, and we can we can go through them. Um, but yeah, you're welcome to look through the blog post if you want. Oh, we do have the A is for Adam video, <laughs> which. I found very interesting. Um, it's uh, as it's a. It was part of a an exhibit from the American Museum of Atomic Energy. No, no. Hang on. Now I have to read my. It's been a while. Uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory has included a short course in nuclear engineering physics, a traveling exhibit from the American Museum of Atomic Energy, a film from GE, A is for Atom, and various symposia on nuclear topics. Ah, the, the original symposium that Virginia Tech hosted <clears throat> was where this video uh, ultimately uh, debuted. So uh, we'll we'll look at some of this history. Um, the A is for Adam video is is cute. I could maybe play a clip, but I've already readjusted the volumes. So of course, you know, I managed to make things more complicated. We know this is not unusual for me, right? Crossing the fingers. That I'm going to make this work. <laughs> it's like a full on film. And of course. Uh, 1950s for the film. The Atomic Age was born. There is no denying Which I think you could tell moment, just by watching the shadow it, that it's the atom bomb has been across all our lives. All men of goodwill earnestly hope that a realistic control of atomic weapons can and will be achieved. Meanwhile, good sense requires that all of us prepare for any eventuality. But wisdom demands, too, that we take time to understand this force, 
because here, in fact, is the answer to a dream as old as man himself, a giant of limitless power at man's command. And where was it science found that giant? In the atom, a particle so... So it's a little educational it, video with... There are other different... This Just sort of looking at atomic element. energy. You're welcome Nuclear to watch it vision. on your own. I'm not going to play the whole thing here. Um, it is uh, hosted on YouTube by the Nuclear Vault YouTube channel. Um, it's cute. Uh, and debuted at a symposium that Virginia Tech hosted in the 50s. So, yeah. Okay. But we're going to be looking at actual like documents from the archives now. So... Um, let me uh, get us to the point where that's possible. Yeah? Hopefully this will be fun for everybody. Document view. I actually did not know a lot about this topic initially. Um, and I had noticed it, but didn't really know anything about it until uh, I worked on that blog post. So you could see I've got like, I have two pages from um, from Sterling about like highlights within the materials we pulled. Um, usually it's just one. So we're gonna start. I don't know, maybe we'll start here. A report of progress and looks to year look to years ahead. That sounds exciting, right? I mean we're gonna look through it specifically for nuclear power plant stuff, but um uh but yeah. It'll be interesting enough, right? Um, so this is a bulletin of VPI. I think there's a... It just points me to the report as being interesting. So, let's see what we got. Uh, 86 years old. Is there any sort of table of contents, I wonder? There's a physics department <laughs> listed. Uh, School of Applied Science and Business Administration. Ag, engineering, I'm guessing the School of Physics or the science school. Let's see, grad school. So this, this is a map of campus. Um, it's an old map of campus, but it's a map of campus. What year was this? Uh, 1958. It doesn't note on here where the nuclear plant will be on the map, so that's fine. That's not the thing. <laughs> it it is it is different a bit, but just you know a bit. Um, if you look over here on this side of campus here, um, where you've got Miles Stadium. If anybody is familiar at all with Virginia Tech Virginia Tech athletics, you'll know um, they do not play in Miles Stadium. They play in Lane Stadium, which. Lane Stadium is roughly here. And there's the Castle Coliseum is roughly here. Uh, so uh, the two big buildings that most people who've never been to campus are aware of are not on uh, this aerial view at all. Um, the library is, although uh, in this version of the library, the 
part of the building that I am sitting in right now does not exist. So... <laughs> so yeah, it has changed a bit. Um, I'm looking for the nuclear plant stuff in here. Let's... Uh, pre-centennial development... I was hoping that it would jump out at me, but might have to look a little deeper. Significant milestones. Ah. Yes. Okay. Significant milestones at VPI. Uh, VPI was, um, it's Virginia Polytechnic Institute. So Virginia Tech's, a f oh. it's full name is uh, Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. Um, before that, it was just Virginia Polytechnic Institute. Uh, and before that, um, uh, Virginia Ag and Mechanical College. Like, it's had a couple of different names over the years. Um, Virginia Tech was just how it was referred to for a while, but now is one of its alternate legal names. So uh, VPI and SU, uh, Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University is technically its full legal name, but Virginia Tech is also a full full legal name. Um, just, you know, the quirks of naming entities, I guess. Let me see if I can get better lighting onto the document here without getting lots of glare. Uh, it's okay-ish. If I do this, I can bump it in a little bit. And then we have the important event. So on this timeline of milestones, uh, you can see here in 1955, the Carol M. Newman Library opened. It cost $2 million in 1955. Um, half of the cost contributed by the Old Dominion Foundation, and it was dedicated in May 1956. At the time, that was the most expensive building ever built on campus. And that was about half the footprint of the current library. Um, it is the same building that I work in. I just work in the, the... I work in the portion of the building that was built in the 70s. Uh, instead of in the 50s, but um, I all, it was connected to the 50s. Anyway, I, I just point that out because it was right next to the one about the nuclear power plant. 1956, nuclear physics laboratory installed with first college-owned reactor simulator and graphite-moderated exponential reactor. So, 1956, and what it means by first college-owned reactor simulator is Tech was the first one in all of North America uh, to install a nuclear reactor simulator. Um, and a, the, the graphite-moderated exponential reactor. So, uh, Tech was the first college campus in North America to have a nuclear reactor. Um, which is kind of neat. One, uh, like, I, th I think it's neat. Um, okay. We'll, we'll get to this in a minute, because th this, this being Appendix to Report of the Nuclear Event of November 12, 1971. The Nuclear Event. It wasn't an accident, at least that's not what they're calling it. But it was an event. So we'll dive into that in a minute, but I want to get to the building of it first. So uh, I've got the proposal. 
And then I've got... Does anybody have knowledge of like the history of educational nuclear reactors at all? Um, if you do, uh, you're welcome to share. Nuclear insurance. I remember that folder being especially interesting. Nuclear reactor laboratory, college of engineering. Uh, no, that's the 80s, 70s. I'm just getting myself oriented to the documents here. Event, exactly he squared. Uh, physics department folder from 1957, 1956. Those are where we want to start. The thing is, there is no collection specifically dedicated to this. So all of this stuff has been pulled together um, from various collections, uh, which partly came from a list of things that I had pulled for the blog post and partly from Sterling doing some looking. So I'm just, I'm glancing real quick, and then we're going to dive into this, uh, this, the physics department folders from the, the mid-50s. Um. <laughs> so much paper. Department of Mechanical Engineering, Institute for Critical Technology, okay. All right. Let's dive in to some documents from right around the time they were trying to get a nuclear reactor on campus and just see what we find. So this is physics department documents from 1956. Um, or it says 56, but it's must be 55, 56, because <laughs> these are dated 55. Officially not working, lurking now, at least until someone walks in. I mean, I still love that people tend to walk in uh, and buy things from you, or shop at least, <laughs> whenever I go live. I think that's fun. Um, so these papers are from Carol Newman. Uh, this is record group 210, uh, where, where these are housed, and, um, come on, I was going to pull it up. I don't know for sure if these are when he was vice president or president, which is what I'm looking at. Um, Carol M. Newman. So, um, Carol Newman is the man who the building I work in was named after. Um, and we have various collections of his stuff. This being 210, so I think this is his presidential papers when he was the university president. Oh, no, so, sorry. This is, uh, this is the Walter Newman stuff. Not Carol. Uh, the Walter S. Newman... Yes. Vice President. President. Yes. Records of the Office of the President Walter S. Newman. <laughs> Covering 1947 to 1962. <sighs> it just says Newman on the folder. Which, absent the context of the rest of the collection, 
super not helpful, which is why I had to look it up because I didn't know. I assumed it was Carol Newman. It's Walter Newman. Anyway, <laughs> we have uh, to start off an article from the Roanoke Times from December 15th, 1955 about nuclear studies. So, 55, this is 10 years after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, correct? Because they were 45, right? I'm double checking my dates. Yes, 1945. So this is this is 10 years later. Um, Virginia Tech expands nuclear studies. It comes as welcome news that Virginia Tech will soon be able to offer broader opportunity for study in nuclear science. This will be made possible by addition to the laboratory equipment of a nuclear reactor simulator, which Tech plans to have in operation next year. Thus, the school will be the first college or university in the country to have such an installation. Already nearing completion is Tech's 2 million volt uh, nuclear accelerator or atom smasher. This is being installed at a cost of one hundred thousand dollars, with money, or sorry, with money and materials donated by Virginia Industries through the Virginia Tech Educational Foundation and the Virginia Engineering Experiment Station. Um, I'm actually going to pull the camera in closer here. Yeah, it's so much better. Uh, staff members and graduate students are doing the work. The simulator will permit training in the nuclear field without the expense entailed in the building of an atomic reactor. It does not call for a special building or large operating costs. With the assistance of industry, college officials, uh, officials explain it is hoped that the reactor simulator can be purchased without the use of state funds. According to John W. Whittemore, uh, Dean of Engineering and Architecture, the new devices will provide at Virginia Tech one of the best equipped college atomic energy laboratories in the country. It will make possible much research for industries having an interest in atomic energy as well as the best available training for students. The installations will be completed by the time Virginia Tech entertains next summer the Oak Ridge Regional Symposium which will be held in cooperation with the Oak Ridge National Laboratory and the Oak Ridge Institute of Nuclear Studies. So, um, it, you all, if you were here at the beginning, uh, the video of the news report was showing off the reactor simulator um, control panel, at least. Uh, and then the second video, the A is for Adam. Uh, video that I played a, a little bit of um, was originally released at the symposium being referenced here. Uh, in conjunction with that meeting, a two-week short course will be offered, the program including lectures by representatives of leading industries in the atomic field. At the suggestion of industry, Virginia Tech is offering a new degree in nuclear engineering physics open to engineering and science graduates. Atomic science opens broad new fields, and the need for nuclear scientists is great. The Virginia Tech program is timely. It is a forward step in preparing students for careers in nuclear science and increases the school's great service to the people. So Tech does not have a reputation as an atomic energy engineering school. Um, at least not today it doesn't. Uh, I don't actually even know if we have a program today. Um, but we were leading the way back in the mid fifties. Uh, so here we've got a letter from the department of physics. Just adjust the camera here. So, um, so you can see this is, uh, addressed to, uh, Dr. Pardue which, oh gosh, now I have to remember university history enough to remember who he is. L.A. P. 
hard to. I don't have to actually remember it. There's a thing called the internet. Uh. So. Oh dear. I don't know. I mean, I don't think the music ever made its way back to the other. Okay. Um, I don't know. Don't know. Oh, thank you, Consilience. Uh, yes, we still do experimental nuclear and particle physics. I wasn't certain, so I'm glad that you uh, found that. Okay, Dr. Pardue. Um, I thought I was finding him. Apparently, also a somewhat common name. I just wanted to know what his position was. I found a yearbook. Which, <laughs> you're welcome to see. I'm, I'm exploring. I was doing internet searches. Uh, this is the 1954 Bugle. Um, the Bugle being our yearbook. Uh, this is hosted on the library's website. Um, in uh, a site called VTech Works. So now... Can I find out who L.A. Pardue is? Uh, it should be OCR'd, so... I did not find it. Lovely. Alright, so we have Walter Newman. That's whose papers the are, these are. He was the president of the university. Ah, there we go. Here on the left, Dr. Uh, Louis A. Pardue, who was apparently vice president of the university. Um, yeah, so that answers my question. Dear Dr. Pardue, I am writing in response to your request for more information on the nuclear symposium and short course we proposed for the summer of 1956. A real need exists for such an undertaking. As a state, Virginia is very active in the nuclear field. Some of the biggest industrial efforts in this field are being made within the boundaries of our state. For instance, the first plant for the commercial manufacture of reactor elements is presently being constructed by Babcock and, uh, by Babcock and Wilcox Company at Lynchburg. Um, which I'm uncertain why, but I'm very familiar with that name. I'm still trying to check the sound of the other stream. I don't, it's fine. It, it may or may not have audio. Or, uh, it's got my voice. It may or may not have music. Because of the shenanigans I was doing earlier trying to play videos. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company has one of the larger nuclear divisions in this country. Reynolds Metals is manufacturing a large fraction of all the special containers for nuclear, nuclear fuel used by the Atomic Energy Commission. It is playing there. Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> um, I just wish there was an easy way for me to check these things. Like, I managed to, I turned around and it wasn't, I, I wasn't getting any levels, so I bumped it. And I was like, did I bump it too far? I don't know. Let me check. Um, 
Reynolds Metals, manufacturing a large fa fraction of special containers for nuclear fuel used by the Atomic Energy Commission. Despite these activities within Virginia, the Virginia institutions of higher learning are lagging behind other institutions in providing educational programs in the nuclear field. Virginia industries are extremely interested in seeing these educational opportunities made available in Virginia. This is quite apparent in the active manner that industry is supporting our nuclear accelerator and nuclear engineering physics program. As yet, no state funds at all have gone into this program. Now that we have added our new graduate degree in nuclear engineering physics, we must familiarize the industries in the state with what we have to offer. A summer symposium and short course should not only interest those industries not yet familiar with the tremendous industrial potential of nuclear science and engineering, but in addition, the symposium might also attract high school and college students. It is proposed, oh my gosh, I just, it, I just reading that last sentence, might also attract high school and college students, and I'm like, yeah, that makes sense because they want to recruit from high schools and other colleges. But we're talking about literal nuclear physics. We're talking about nuclear engineering and nuclear power plants. And we're talking about attracting high school age students to come and learn about them. And I'm like, huh. All the time that I've looked at this topic and its association with college education, it never occurred to me that it was students that young that were starting to learn about the operation of nuclear power plants. That seems concerning, but also that's when we expect students to learn the things they will need in their career. So, huh. I just know enough about the behavior of college students to be concerned that they're learning about and operating nuclear power plants amidst all of the other um, behavior that college students sometimes uh, get into. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Total tangent there, but... Uh, it is proposed that we request an Oak Ridge Regional Symposium. <laughs> Someone has to learn to... I know! Conciliates, I know! Like, somebody has to learn to operate them, but it was just like, oh. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, let's just hand over control of this, um, m potentially massive destructive force to, uh, inexperienced... Yeah. There was at least one kid's science kit on the market in the early 50s that was specifically to teach kids about atomic physics. Also, like, the, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the video, the A is for Adam, was generally aimed at, at younger kids as the audience to teach them about nuclear, uh, nuclear science. It was fashionable at the time at all levels. And, and, like, Yes, it makes sense that college students would be studying this. It's just that it had never fully sunk in that it was college students that were learning about this. <laughs> college students and, and their level of maturity. <laughs> so... Um... Symposium to possibly be held on a Monday or and Thursday during July at VPI. Um, huh. Thank you, Hannah, for for checking on the sound. Um, as long as it's not too bad, I'm, I'm gonna leave it alone. Uh, Alright, so they wanted to host the symposium. We would request that, except for speakers from our own staff, the speakers be provided by Oak Ridge, Na uh, Oak Ridge Institute of Nuclear Studies and Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, we would expect that these agencies would handle the expenses of their speakers, as well as the cost of printing the programs. 
and certainly VPI should plan to have a dinner with the Oak Ridge people as their guests, and in view of the support uh, that can be given us by Oak Ridge, it would probably also be good business to provide the speakers with accommodations at no charge. Uh, the number of speakers would be small, preferably 6 to 10. Might hope to have 10 to 15 important industrialists in attendance. Uh... Uh, says they want to hold it in Hillcrest Hall, or uh, house them in Hillcrest. Um, planning a dinner. Okay, so this was just uh, initial from <clears throat> Thomas Hahn, Jr., the head of the Department of Physics, uh, just basically a quick note to the vice president saying, hey, we think we should uh, host this symposium, um, but we need to put in a proposal soon if we're actually going to do it. Oh my gosh. Hello, Puddle Glum. No longer work lurking. Now do we neither working nor lurking. Um, I appreciate that. Welcome in. Um, we're looking at things related to the history of Virginia Tech's nuclear power plant today. Um, because yes, Virginia Tech had a nuclear power plant. We don't presently. Uh, ooh, okay. This should be good. December 13th, 1955, to uh, Walter S. Newman, President I'm writing to acquaint you with the training facilities that we have procured for our graduate program in nuclear engineering physics. It's so shaky. I'm sorry. What is going on? Camera. Seriously, what are you doing? <laughs> sorry. That was unusual behavior. Anyway. Uh... And to ask permission for us to request from the Atomic Energy Commission additional educational facilities. A real need exists, uh, sort of the same start to the previous letter that we saw. Uh, for instance, the first plant for the commercial manufacture of nuclear power elements is uh, Lynchburg. Yeah, uh, background overview for our nuclear engineering physics program at Virginia Polytechnic Institute. Training facilities include a nuclear reactor, or sorry, a <laughs> nuclear accelerator and a nuclear reactor simulator. These facilities have been obtained entirely without the use of state funds, contributions having come from industries anxious for the initiation of training of nuclear engineers at VPI. In addition to these facilities, we should like to attempt to obtain the necessary materials for a small, subcritical assembly, which would enable students in our program to receive training in the actual handling of uranium. This would, of course, not duplicate any research reactor facilities, which may be planned or might be obtained by any of, <clears throat> of the Virginia schools. A subcritical assembly is primarily an educational and training facility. Uh, we have discussed recently with the representatives of the AEC, AEC being Atomic Energy uh, Commission, the possibility of VPIs obtaining the necessary materials for such a small subcritical assembly. We understand that a request from VPI to the AEC for these, these materials is likely to be received favorably. If such materials should be made available to us by the AEC, the subcritical assembly would also not require any state funds, and it would not require any additional space since it could be located in the laboratory room containing the other nuclear facilities. Since this is the case, and since this would not duplicate any research reactors planned, Permission is requested for us to begin negotiation with the AEC to obtain the additional facilities necessary for the education of nuclear engineers and scientists at VPI. <clears throat> yes. Okay, so Puddleglum, um, yes, subcritical is a very specific term when talking about nuclear power and materials. It uh, Subcritical meaning um, they get experience working with the relevant things like uranium but the reactor is not capable of sustaining uh, of a sustained nuclear reaction so it it never reaches criticality um so it, it limits the number of things that can be done with it um and so they did they had the accelerator 
And then they got the um, nuclear reactor simulator, and they were the first uh, facility, the first um, educational facility in the U.S. to install a nuclear reactor simulator. Um, they do get the subcritical reactor, and eventually they get a critical reactor. Um, let's see, this is July of 56. So I'm just, this is like updates on, on facilities. The principal experimental facilities utilized for training and research in nuclear engineering physics at VPI are described. The first was, uh, was the 2 million volt nuclear accelerator. This accelerator, which I believe is the largest university-owned accelerator in the southeastern part of the country, except for the one Dr. Pardue constructed and I later rebuilt at the University of Kentucky, was built here by the physics staff and graduate students. Construction was initiated in the fall of 1954 and is now essentially complete. The accelerator is now valued at approximately $125,000 and was built without the use of state funds. Recently, about $7,000 in state funds has been used for the purchase of auxiliary uh, equipment, which is being used with the accelerator installation. Most of this apparatus is needed in the operation of any physics department and was replacement for obsolete equipment. The nuclear accelerator installation is an extremely valuable research and training installation. So, <clears throat> this is the mid 1950s. Um, the uh, the nuclear reactor simulator that they installed was a product of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. That Tech was selected as the place to install it. It was put together by people who were specifically working in nuclear energy engineering uh, as a way to train people who were learning that field. The accelerator <laughs> that they had was not designed by anyone actively working in the field. It was not a product that was purchased and then put together. They built it from scratch themselves in the building, the physics building on campus. So, hi, Fluidan. <laughs> Detective Zen, I bet the professor in charge would be capable of sustained nuclear reaction if his students messed around too much. <laughs> I suppose that's possible. So I just think it's it's interesting. Uh, the the accelerator on campus was basically a homebrew, like, built thing. Because you couldn't just buy one. You couldn't just buy one and have it installed. It was 1954, and they built it. from scratch. Um, the second major facility is the first university-owned commercial nuclear reactor simulator facility. This fine training facility has been built under contract by the Leeds and Northrop Company and is scheduled for installation in the next few weeks. The order for this equipment was placed in December 1955. The nuclear reactor simulator consists of a reactor control console, electronic analog computer, and dynamic reactor model. With its installation, students can be trained in the operation of reactors of all types instead of just one type, as would be the case with a single actual reactor. So there's the benefit of the simulator, is uh, they can reconfigure it so that students can learn how to operate different types of reactors, uh, whereas if they just had a reactor, the students would only learn how to operate that reactor. I don't believe you can order reactors from a mail order catalog today, but uh, Puddle Glum, as an institution working with the, um, oh gosh, I forget what they're called today. They were the Atomic Energy Commission in the past. And the Nuclear Regulatory Committee, I think is what they're called now, or commission. I don't remember. 
um, uh, working through them, there would be some sort of manufacturing company that made the reactor and shipped it to you in parts, and their experts would come in and install it. So it wouldn't be building it from scratch on your own from a design that you just made up. <laughs> um, which is the, the accelerator that they had, they built from scratch from a design they made up. <laughs> Boo, my energy bills are too dang high. All I'd need is a countertop version. Um, I, I understand that. I suppose. Um, let's see. Okay, so the the simulator, valued at 15000 has been obtained without the use of state funds. Apparently, they were big into that. Uh, both this facility and the nuclear accelerator have been financed by Virginia Industries. Um, yeah, yeah, that's duplicate information of what we... Okay, so the latest major nuclear installation acquired by VPI is its exponential reactor. This fine research and training facility will be valued at approximately $250,000 and has been made possible by the Atomic Energy Commission. Approval for release of 2,500 pounds of uranium fuel elements and, ex and an extremely valuable neutron source was made under the AEC policy of supporting those programs making a major contribution in alleviating the current shortage of nuclear scientists and engineers. This VPI exponential reactor is the second university-operated exponential reactor and the first to use a graphite moderator. The graphite was purchased in rough form with $13,500 in state funds and has been machined by VPI students and staff for the past several months. Negotiations for the exponential reactor were initiated in December 1955. Construction is scheduled to be completed in August. The exponential reactor will not only serve as an invaluable training device, but when used with the accelerator will make possible new and unique reactor research. In addition, all of the nuclear work has necessitated the addition of cer certain heavy machine tools valued at $30,000. Uh, following our usual procedure of obtaining materials and equipment, blah, 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 blah. Um, additional nuclear facilities under construction include highly specialized detection equipment such as liquid, a liquid propane bubble chamber and a high pressure cloud chamber. Completion of these facilities is scheduled for the fall and is again being made possible by industrial contributions at no cost to the state. The completed facilities will be valued at $30,000. In summary, let me say that we now have one of the leading nuclear engineering programs in the country. We started acquiring the, acquiring the experimental facilities for this program in the fall of 1954, uh, and they're now all complete or nearing completion, worth about 450000 but at a cost of about 25000 uh, to the state budget. Um, that's interesting. Okay, so... I think that's... most of the stuff in here that's about the reactors, or the... specifically those tools. Ooh! Except for this. Focus. Focus! <laughs> the nuclear engineering program is... This nuclear engineering program is made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Kind of. Except it was private business that was the, the viewers like you. Um, proposal for a subcritical reactor for use in a training program in nuclear engineering physics, Virginia Polytechnic Institute, December 29th, 1955. Uh, we're just going to look at the introduction. I might be willing to jump to some specifics, but um, it's a lengthy proposal, so I'm definitely not looking at the entire thing. In response to interest shown by industries in the Virginia area, VPI has initiated a new graduate program leading to the, the degree of Master of Science in Nuclear Engineering Physics. This program is to be administered by the Department of Physics and is offered jointly in a fine cooperative spirit by several engineering and science departments. It is open to qualified graduates in either engineering or science. Uh, areas in which coursework will be offered include nuclear and reactor physics, nuclear engineering, partial differential equations and boundary value problems, 
thermodynamics, strengths of materials, heat transmission and power engineering, and instrumentation. The program begins in September 1956. In addition, a short course of two weeks duration is being planned for the summer of 1956. A request has been made for the Oak Ridge Regional Symposium to be given in Blacksburg at the beginning of the short course. Uh, and yeah, that was the introduction. So uh, a lot of, it looks like mainly duplicative information of uh, stuff that we already got from the letters. Um, there's some uh, personnel listings, and I'm only showing a tiny bit here just to note Andrew Robeson, Assist Associate Professor of Physics, because um, Robeson Hall uh, was the building that ended up getting the, the reactor in it. It was not named for him at, at this time, uh, but later was named for him, renamed for him, um, and was the physics building. I think it still is the physics building, it just doesn't have any reactors anymore. Um, and then there's some proposal for some courses. Uh, genuinely concerned about the increasing shortage of persons trained in atomic reactor technology. 1956, so we're 11 years after the, the um, atomic weapons were used on Japan. So at least 20 years or so since the beginning of the in-depth research into atomic energy. Uh, we're past the Manhattan Project. We're, yeah. Uh, let's see. Recognizing that large technical schools such as VPI have a primary responsibility in attempting to alleviate the shortage, we established a graduate program leading to the, ma the blah, 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 blah. Um, major experimental facilities available include the nuclear reactor simulator, subcritical assembly, and uh, 1.5 MeV nuclear accelerator. Uh, MeV... Is that mega electron volts? What is what is MEV? In physics. Mega electron volt. I got it right. I got it right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, and then they also wanted to offer twice annually an integrated sequence of courses, six months in duration, designed to cover the basic unclassified work in atomic reactor technology. That unclassified notific uh, uh, like uh, designation here, very important. Uh, this program would be available for mature students prior to a period of training of similar duration at the Oak Ridge School of Reactor Technology. Uh, details of the proposed program are set forth in this proposal. Uh, we represent that we have not employed or retained a company or person to solicit or secure this contract. Oh, geez, wow. Um, so, yeah, they were putting in a proposal for teaching some classes. First quarter, uh, let's see, Applied Mechanics 302. Mechanics of Materials, and Chemistry 202, Chemical Principles, uh, Mathematics 411, Fourier Series, and Partial Differential Equations, uh, Mechanical Engineering 507, Heat Transmission, and Physics 502, Nuclear Physics, with the second quarter being Applied Mechanics 303, Fluid Mechanics, uh, Chemistry 202B, Chemical Principles, Mathematics 421, Fourier Series, and uh, Partial Differential Equations, uh, mechanical Engineering 512, Heat Engineering, Physics 502B, more nuclear physics. Um, and so it looks like the chemistry, the, the chemical principles course and the nuclear physics course are new additions. Hmm. 
Here. Anyway. Some interesting things. <laughs> five points. I got five points for correctly uh, figuring out what MEV stood for. Yay. I'll take them. Um, so that was uh, 1956 documents. I want to look ahead. so much stuff. Um, again, I did a blog post on this, so there's definitely things to see in the blog post that um, we won't necessarily look at today. Uh, the link, if you use the um, finding aid command, it can get you the link to the blog post. All right, uh, let's see. This is July 1958, July 1st. What am I looking for here? The tech gram. Volume 35. Number 19. Ah. It's the first article, the one on the left. <laughs> tech gets 114,098 dollars in grant from AEC. So this is July 1st, 1958. Um, the Atomic Energy Commission announced June 7th that it had granted, it has granted VPI an additional $114,098 in support of continued expansion and strengthening of its program in nuclear engineering. The new grant uh, brought to a total of 350,000 the funds awarded tech by the AEC and the maximum amount available to any academic institution from the commission. So, again, like, within four years of starting to build their nuclear accelerator, which was the first piece of equipment, they were at the forefront of educational programs. Um, they had the largest financial support from the Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, they had... 2,500 pounds of uranium and other special nuclear materials and equipment that had been made available to them. Um, the new grant will be used for the purchase of a 10 kilowatt Argonaut reactor, which was recently developed by the AEC specifically for college and university use. Uh, VPI will be the first institution in the country to install the new reactor. The Argonaut Critical Reactor will supplement the outstanding facilities already available for graduate nuclear engineering education here. These facilities, which have been attracting graduate students from all over the country, include a nuclear reactor simulator, two exponential reactors, a sigma pile. What's a sigma pile? Somebody, does anybody know? Uh, two accelerators and well-equipped counting, radiochemistry, nuclear metallurgy, heat transmission, and nuclear engineering technolo technology laboratories. Construction of a new physics building is scheduled to begin at Tech within the next few months. 114098 in 1958 would be $1,225,176 in 2024 adjusted for inflation. Thank you. Yeah, one one fourteen. that's a that's just a, a grad school education in the US today. Hi, Meridu. <gasps> um, the U.S. Naval Department or Development Center plans to send several of their nuclear staff members to BPI this summer for special experimental training in reactor engineering under a special contract. So yeah, that's that entire article. But like, they were at the forefront of nuclear engineering education and the US Navy was sending people here to tech to study the topic. <laughs> Are you sure it's the Argonaut facility? I hate to think someone's pulling the wool over your eyes. Um, <laughs> it is the Argonaut. Um, uh, I don't know that anybody named Jason was involved. Uh, but you need some pun points at some point in the future. Uh, if, if we want to note that down. Let's 
let's see, 37. I think I have a picture of, that I know for sure is the Argonaut somewhere. Does the Argonaut facility deal with occasional intrusions by stop motion skeletons? This is a reference to a video game, I'm assuming, but do not know which one it is. Or... Stop motion. It's a reference to some sort of entertainment that I'm uh, not placing immediately. I would be very interested in knowing, though. Uh, version 37, number 7. Mm. Ooh, yeah. Oh, the the old Jason and the Argonauts movie, because it was the stop, stop motion, um, notable for its use of special effects. Okay, Th that came to mind, I just wasn't certain... But, but yes, I am familiar with that movie. It's the only Jason and the Argonauts movie that I'm familiar with. But, uh, here we have January 15th, 1960. Harryhausen? Yes. That's the, that was the director, correct? <laughs> Me and details. <laughs> Getting to know one another. My bad, it was 1963. Oh, the special effects were done by Harry House. Gotcha. Yeah, I know I'm familiar with the movie, but it's been a long time. And I, I don't know the details of like who, uh, but I, yeah, I, I do recall the movie. <clears throat> UTR-10 reactor started at tech as industrialists, industrialists call future bright. Then nuclear age burst from the building uh, wait, sorry, my my brain. Wow, this is totally just a formatting thing. Because below it there is that gutter, the this gap here. But also the first two lines here have a space in the same place where that gutter is. My brain thought that after the word two, I would need to move back. Um, that's not the case, and uh, it just, it tripped me up. I'm going to start again. <laughs> oh, my dad made sure we watched that Jason and the Argonauts movie. We're also big into cheesy sci-fi and fantasy movies and, and MST3K. Um, I have recently watched a bunch of the early um, Godzilla movies from Japan, uh, and their special effects are basically identical to the original series of Star Trek. Um, that they almost felt like they could have just been Star Trek episodes. Uh, because they looked exactly the same. Um. <laughs> I know they're trying to be excited, but I really don't want anything nuclear to burst from any buildings. Um, Detective Zen, yes. <laughs> yeah, the layout... I agree, Puddle Glum. Um, it, it is a bit of a problem. Like, I understand the newspaper layout bit. My only problem is the way that those spaces line up in the first two lines of this article. And the fact that they are perfectly aligned with the gutter below it uh, just makes it not intuitive to, 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 to read through. Um, but I'm going to try again. The nuclear age burst from the building. A building. Budding. Third time's the charm. The nuclear age burst from the budding to the blooming a stage at Virginia Tech January 6 with the dedication of the college's UTR-10 University Teaching and Research Reactor. The elaborate dedication program included a luncheon and roundtable discussion at Faculty Center on power and other industrial uses of nuclear energy, a speaking program in Commerce Hall, and ceremonies in the new physics building, which formally placed the critical reactor into operation. A snowfall January 6th caused several of the invited guests to cancel their plans to attend the ceremonies, but more than 100 persons were on hand for the event. 
at the Commerce Hall program, Lieutenant Governor A.E.S. Stevens outlined the industrial growth of Virginia since the 17th century and stressed the importance of providing facilities for the huge college enrollment expected within the next decade. To deny Virginia youths the chance to get an education because of lack of room for them at the colleges would be unfair, undemocratic, and could be catastrophic, Stevens said. On the same pro blah, 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 blah. Anyway, it was just interesting because they, you know, they were highlighting the fact that it had turned on. Um, it's the UTR-10 Argonaut-type reactor. Uh, which I do want to highlight specifically what, what does that mean? Um, and the best way I have to do that is... Uh, to come back over here and just read you the words that I wrote in this blog post. <laughs> so two years after opening the, the lab in 1958, Tech was awarded the grant from the Atomic Energy Commission that allowed them to purchase a 10 kilowatt Argonaut reactor. And Argonaut is an abbreviation, it's an acronym, uh, that stands for Argonne Nuclear Assembly for University Training Reactor. Um, I'm very curious how long it took them to come up with the acronym. I love that it's called Argonaut. It's a class of small nuclear research reactors based on the one developed at the Argonne National Laboratory. Um, and so, uh, and you'll note here, Unlike the subcritical reactor that was already in operation, the Argonaut was a critical reactor, meaning that the nuclear chain reaction would be self-sustaining. And once again, Tech was set to be the first university in the US to install this type of research reactor. And then of course, you know, I note, according to Wikipedia, cite your sources. Um, I didn't go past that for a blog post. Uh, so that's why it's like, according to Wikipedia, uh, University of Florida might have beaten Virginia Tech into operation by about six months. Um, but I didn't, I didn't dive in further into that. Um, this is the Wikipedia article about the Argonaut class reactor. Uh, if you wanted to learn more. The original was built at Argonne National Laboratory and went critical for the first time on February 9th, 1957. It was shut down in 1972. It was a 10 kilowatt reactor. Um, and as you can see here, there are there's a listing in Wikipedia of all of the Argonaut class research reactors in the world. Um, so apparently there was one in Australia at uh, Moata the Australian Atomic Energy Commission? I don't know. Um, but if we scroll down and go to the US and find Virginia Tech, um, you'll note this column with the numbers, thermal power kilowatts. Uh, when they were first installing it, it was a 10 kilowatt UTR-10. Or, yeah, it was a UTR-10. Uh, it was later upgraded to 100 kilowatts. Um, it's been decommissioned, as you can see here. It was originally, uh, it originally went critical the 1st of Feb... Uh, uh, the 12th, sorry, of January uh, 1959 and uh, was decommissioned in 1984. Um... I just, I find it really interesting that there was a nuclear reactor on campus. And not just that, there were multiple nuclear reactors on campus. Uh, oh, that was the um, the Argonaut reactor article. Argonaut class reactor. I can, I can drop the link. It's also linked in the blog post too, so. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, 
Uh, tech First University to get nuclear reactors. Sim simulator. We've talked about that a bunch already. Um, so we have... I, I love this as just an illustration of how big this was. Um, <clears throat> this is the July 1st, 1956 edition of the Techgram. Uh, above the paper's title. Like, the title of the, the paper is here. The header of the paper that would usually span the entire upper portion. Like, a normal edition. This is a newsletter, technically. Not, like, a newspaper, but it's a, a newsletter that gets sent out to people associated with the university. Um... But this is the how it normally is headered. July 1st, 1956 edition. They took the entire newsletter's header and made it secondary to the title of the article, Tech Gets Uranium for Reactor. <laughs> like, that's how big it was, how big of a deal it was that Tech was getting this uranium. Um, a neutron source and 2,500 uh, 2, pounds of natural uranium metal to be used in connection with expanding instruction in nuclear engineering have been approved for Virginia Tech, the Atomic Energy Commission announced in Washington June 21st. The uranium will be used by Virginia Tech in the construction of the first university-owned graphite-moderated exponential reactor. Uh, commenting on the AEC's action, Dr. T.M. Hahn Jr., head of the physics department, said, When completed, the new exponential reactor, along with the 2 million volt nuclear accelerator, nuclear reactor simulator, and associated nuclear equipment, will give Virginia Tech nuclear facilities valued at nearly a half a million dollars. Uh, he pointed out that all of these facilities have been acquired at very little cost to Virginia taxpayers. Um, they loved to harp on that one, but... Did the entire publishing department shrug when someone asked how to lay it out? Detective Zen, I don't know. Um, it seems weird to me that they would ever shrink the header of the thing. Um, but it also screams to me that they thought this was an important story. <laughs> so not just a headline not just above the fold on the front page literally above the title of the newsletter um i just just absolutely befuddling to me <laughs> um all right let's see what next what next is 16-bit Eric and the Whimsies coming in. Hello, welcome. Welcome, Whimsies. It is good to see you. I hope that you were having a good time over at uh, Eric's stream. I am. If you're not familiar, I am Rogan27. Hello. Uh, this is a show that uh, I, I titled Archival Adventures. Um, where we look at materials from archives and special collections at Virginia Tech. Uh, today we're looking at things relating to Virginia Tech's nuclear power plant, or nuclear, nu nuclear reactors, uh, nuclear technology. Um, so uh, I've got, <laughs> yes, broadcasting from the void, woo! I am co-streaming myself, yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're doing uh, pictures. So uh, as you can see here, this is this is a university relations photo of the uh, Tech Argonaut reactor. This photo is from the like 1970s, but Tech was installing all this stuff in the mid 50s. Um, and and yeah, that's this is what we're doing today. Uh, I um, for anybody new, I'm an archivist here at Virginia Tech, and um, yeah, I do this on Wednesdays. We share 
interesting things from the archives. So I find it fascinating um, that Tech had this. Uh, so it started out Tech, a couple of, I'm, I'm going to summarize everything we've learned so far in, in the episode. Um, a couple of professors and grad students in the physics department um, built a nuclear accelerator in the physics building from scratch on their own. Then Tech got uh, the nuclear reactor simulator, I believe. Then it was the exponential reactors, the subcritical reactors, uh, and then finally, like four years after they first started building the accelerator, they um, Tech had its first full full like criticality reactor uh, that was a ten megawatt um, UTR um, Argonaut reactor that was later upgraded to a hundred watt. Uh, before then in 1984 being uh, decommissioned. So you can see the control panel of uh, an actual like small nuclear reactor that w was on campus for a while. <laughs> so talking about splitting atoms, we have a split Rogan 27 for a co-streaming opportunity. Yes, indeed. Oh, Blue Rooster, you used to have a nuclear reactor in Puerto Rico, which closed down pretty quickly. People realized that having a nuclear reactor on an island next to a giant fault, not the best idea. Well, not just that, but on an island next to a giant fault uh, where annually you get hit by hurricanes. <laughs> like, yeah, um, somewhat, somewhat difficult, I would say, to, to make sure that things are stable. Um, there's, a, there's a document I would love to show. I just have to figure out where it is. There's something in here. I don't know if it's on the notes that Sterling left me. Better to shut down than meltdown, yes. Um, there's Documents somewhere about nuclear waste. Radioactive waste storage. Ha ha! Um, RG61... No, RG512. The nuclear waste storage, uh, Sterling, was the, the document that I was like, I remember that this exists, but I don't know where it is. Um, and it's, it's on your... Uh, I have never shared it. It didn't make it into the blog post because uh, I just, the post was getting too long. But I have these wonderful um, notes about like, here are some interesting things uh, that Sterling was kind enough to put together for me. So, we're jumping forward in time a little bit with this one. But, I think they're interesting. I had planned them for the, um, for the blog post. I just have to find the right one. Do I have the wrong folder? No. No. I know, it's so many things. And honestly, when I started looking into this, the first time I looked at it, we thought there were, like, maybe one or two documents total. Um, but over the years, I've found more. Uh, let's see. I'm going to skip through if it's not about the nuclear waste. So this one starts... This is 1971. This is transfer of nuclear engineering faculty members from physics to mechanical engineering, not exactly what we're wanting. Uh, financial aspects of reactor uh, operation. Nope. Read and return, copies have not been sent. From 
Maxed out. Discretion. That's not it. Those. Operating money's not what I want either. I might have the wrong folder. That's fine. Allotments of positions. Yeah, this is all about just... Mm. Okay. It's not that one. Uh, maybe it's 6-1? There are three folders listed with three possible topics inside of it. One of the topics is the one I'm interested in. Uh, so, mm, I will check. 632B, no. 18-9, no. There are so many documents. Um... 2517 159184 Ooh, 6-1. Found it yet? It would be later. Um, I don't think it, it wasn't with the insurance documents, I don't think. Although it could have been. Nope. It's here somewhere. I'm like, I know it exists. I know it does. Um, nuclear reactors, 1973-4. Radioactive waste storage. That's what I wanted. <gasps> I found it. Okay, February 18, 1974. Memorandum to Dr. John A. Uh, Balweg from Alfred H. Krebs. Subject, radioactive waste storage. This is to advise you that the recommendation regarding the use of rooms 13 and 15 in Robeson Hall for office space for reactor personnel and for radioactive waste storage until the planned hazardous, hazardous materials storage and disposal, and disposal facility is constructed was considered and approved. Basically, no alternate solution to the problem could be, could be identified. It is my assumption that buildings and grounds will be advised by Vice President Castle of the of this decision for purposes of making the necessary modifications, including the changing of locks, to adapt the rooms for the changed uses. However, you should be prepared to provide such, such suggestions as you deem appropriate for these modifications. If you have not been contacted by the time you have prepared your suggestions with regard to the modifications to be made, please forward them to me and I will refer them to buildings and grounds. Does anyone see any problems here? Because when I first read this, I couldn't believe it. This memo is from February 18th, 1974. And basically, they're approving a plan to store radioactive waste in the same place where the office space for the reactor personnel will be. They're going to store the radioactive waste in the 
offices of the people who work with the reactor. Yes, key squared. Combined use, office space, and radioactive waste storage. Temporarily, while they wait, while, while they're building an, uh, a hazardous materials storage and disposal facility. Some men just want to make the world glow. They'd save on lighting bills. <laughs> Sounds alarmingly like an old job of mine. Um, yeah. Uh, jumping back just a bit. February 6th, 1974. So the, the previous one was February 18th. Exactly. Nothing could possibly go wrong. Uh, attached our memoranda and letters. Um from John Balweg, two outside consultants on radiation safety uh, from the physics department and from A. Keith Furr, all relating to the problem of locating space for storage of radioactive waste and the officing of reactor personnel. It is apparent that the storage of radioactive waste from university operations does not constitute a hazard to students or to other members of the university community. I still, I, I question this. Oh, thank you, Hannah. Um, recommendations, this is recommended that rooms that were, uh, um, yeah, that they're going to use spaces for personnel and waste storage, which just, I know it was the 70s, but wow. Wow. Uh, okay, uh, this one is January 22nd, 1974. Um, a search for an alternate location for waste storage room and a counter area has been unsuccessful. While there appears to be general agreement that the most appropriate location for waste storage would be in an area apart from the academic buildings, no suitable space appears to be available at the present time. It is my understanding that a storage building will be constructed in the near future and that waste storage will be moved to the storage facility at the earliest possible date. Should rooms 13 and 15 in Robeson uh, be des designated to serve reactor needs, it is expected, one, that adequate security will be provided to prevent possible contamination, two, that use of the rooms will be temporary and space will, be, will revert to use by the physics department as soon as another location is found. Since the rooms are expected to be returned to academic use, it is hoped that construction will be kept at a minimum. Items currently in the room will be placed in storage or, re or remain in the room if they do not interfere with reactor operations. The thing is, this was 74. And this was sort of the attitude about nuclear waste in 74. Um, you see it in the fiction. Like... Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, we'll just put those put those barrels over there. It'll it'll be fine. It will not be fine, but uh, uh, these I just find these all fascinating. They're jumping around in time a little bit, but this sounds like something out of an episode of Well, there's your problem. <laughs> I've never heard of this show, but um, I, I think I understand. Uh, yesterday, I received, as did several others, a copy of a letter by Dr. Teplitz in regard to the problem of radioactive waste storage on campus. Attached was a note by Dr. James A. Jacobs to Dr. Teplitz, uh, and it is in regard to this attached note that I wish to comment. Dr. Jacobs' note was unfortunate. His analogy to... Sticks of dynamite of the low-level waste containers was, I feel, especially inappropriate and could readily be construed as an attempt to s at scare tactics to avoid loss of space by the physics department. In a similar vein, the reference to the unfortunate injuries suffered by the early users of radiation could lead a careless reader to infer that similar incidents could happen here. Perhaps we should never permit a dental x-ray, watch color, te color TV, or take a long jet flight. The radiation levels are comparable. Um, the mention of, as yet, non-existent physics experiments 
that could be adversely affected by these low levels could lead one to ask for a description of these experiments and of their likelihood for the foreseeable future. I hesitated before writing this letter since I have the greatest respect for Dr. Jacobs. It, sure you do. Uh, and have enjoyed a close, a close friendship with him for many years. However, the tenor of his note was such that if left unanswered, serious reservations could be raised concerning the use of radioactivity in any form at the university. Reservations which I do not believe are justified. As you will recall, I solicited at your request comments by two knowledgeable outsiders, Mr. Beck of the University of Illinois and Mr. Cure of Babcock and Wilcox. The objective comments of these two outside consultants, again, I believe, support this attitude on my part. There is unanimous agreement that the best general solution would be a separate building for the storage of these wastes and hazardous chemicals. I have been recently assured by Mr. Stuart Castle that this building has a very high priority in the university's capital, capital requests. Um, <clears throat> just internal note here. Um, very high priority on the long-term facilities planning of a large university means that something might sit in the top 10 projects to be done for more than a decade. <clears throat> Although the legislative mood must obviously be careful because of the present economic outlook, the relative size of this request would, I think, lead to a certain optimism. I would hope that I have not been unfair nor unreasonable in my rejection of Dr. Jacobs' contentions. I do not think, however, that the issue should be clouded by the raising of phantom specters. It's an engineering disaster podcast. <laughs> do you want hulks, people? This is how you get hulks. The objective consultant is from the company that sells the thing. It, this is true key squared. <clears throat> okay, so this one is, uh, I think, the day before the last one. Yeah. January 9th, 1974. The physics department feels that a basic precaution uh, in the centralization of storage of radioactive waste is to locate the storage area in a non-academic building with minimum use by students and the general public. Huh. Go figure. The people who work with the material and know what it's capable of suggested doing something with it that was actually the thing that needed to be done in order to make it safe. Hmm, surprising that. Um, this is not to imply reservations about the growing use of radioactive materials or about the procedures for handling the waste. We do not expect difficulties or disasters, but we feel strongly uh, that no avoidable risk should be taken, that one simple but effective piece of insurance against the unexpected is to keep radioactive wastes away from people. We think the following points should be considered. One, the potential for accidents. The potential is small, but it is real. Vandalism, uh, which seems to occur with increasing frequency and is much more likely in academic buildings, could result in a variety of unpleasant scenarios. Fire, flood, and human fallibility are also small but real possibilities. Attached are some comments by Professor of Physics Jacobs, former chairman of the Radiation Safety Committee, putting these avoidable risks in perspective. Two, inappropriateness of the use of Robeson. Um, it is natural, but incorrect, to assume that the physics department and the nuclear reactor produce the lion's share of radioactive waste. In fact, only 25% of the waste originates from Robeson, as detailed on the attached memo by the radiation safety officer, Cy Myers. It is similarly natural, but incorrect, to assume that in the event of minor mishaps, use of Robeson would minimize, among academic buildings, the resulting dislocation. In fact, Professor Jacobs' memo points out that the physics research and teaching effort is more, not less, likely to be perturbed by small increases in levels of radioactivity. Three, <clears throat> space considerations in Robeson. The rooms tentatively designated for storage are inappropriate. One contains a machine for liquefying helium, which has a high probability of needing to be reactivated in the near future due to current difficulties in the delivery of already liquefied helium. Both rooms are badly placed with respect to exits and would maximize the resulting difficulty in case of mishap. In the event of university decision to use Robeson, the department would prefer to rearrange some basement space utilization so as to make available more appropriate space. Four, 
preferred location for radioactive waste storage, the department urges that a fenced area not frequented by students and the general public, such as the central stores compound, be selected. Within this area, either partition space or an existing building or a heated, or sorry, either partition space in an existing building or a heated trailer would be satisfactory for the temporary storage required. Five, sensible university policy. With the university wisely assuming campus-wide responsibility for storage of radioactive waste, it would seem only prudent to avoid taking any avoidable risks. It is one thing for some academic buildings to be used for storage of radioactive waste in the absence of university-wide policy. It is a far different matter to deliberately select such a site. I totally agree with that letter. Like, hello. Um... I love this one. This is to Vic from Jim. Radioactive Waste, January 8th, 1974. So this is the day before the one we just read. I feel very strongly that radioactive wastes should not be stored in the physics building, or indeed in any other academic building, for several reasons. The first of these is the element of danger. Go figure. It may indeed be that storage in academic buildings with certain precautions would not violate the regulations of the Atomic Energy Commission. It may also be that some universities are doing this. This does not, however, make the practice advisable. In the early days of the use of radioactive materials and radiation, very few precautions were taken. As a result, numerous people lost hands, legs, eyes, or their lives. As we have become more and more aware of the dangers of radioactive material and radiation, restrictions regarding their use and storage have been continually tightened. I would regard the storage of radioactive materials within the physics building as somewhat equivalent to the storage of a few sticks of dynamite. I doubt it would be very happy. I doubt if you would be very happy if I proposed to store five sticks of dynamite in my office. I would agree to store them in a locked desk drawer and to keep the door to my office locked at all times. I would post a danger notice on the door if you wished. I would point out that the dynamite would not go off unless somebody broke in and tampered with it, or a stroke of lightning hit it, or something of that sort. Of, of, of course, this sort of thing could also happen to the radioactive material that might be stored behind locked doors in the physics building. I think you will see my point that any unnecessary storage of any dangerous material in an academic building should not be encouraged. The second reason I would not like to see radioactive materials stored in the physics building is that any increase in the background radiation, even though it is below a level that might pose a health threat, might still make a sensitive experiment requiring absolute minimum of background uh, difficult or impossible to perform. Such experiments are probably more likely to be encountered in the physics department than any other department. You may say that the amount of radioactive material to be stored is minimal and adequate shielding will be provided. However, as far as I know, there are no alternate plans to store larger amounts of radioactive wastes, which we may have from time to time. They would, I am pretty sure, go into the same barrels in whatever building the rest of the waste is stored in. Uh, I do not mean to imply that the use of radioactive materials, where necessary for worthwhile experiments, should be prohibited or discouraged. I simply mean that proper precautions should be taken and that no un unnecessary risk should be allowed. Storage of radioactive wastes in any academic building, I feel, is an entirely unnecessary risk. <sighs> I the, This series of letters... I just, when I first came across them, I was like, uh, what? Um, so, yeah. Uh, I don't know for certain what happened. Because the last document that I have located is the memo from February 18th saying, oh yeah, sure, we'll just put it in the... Uh, the We've, we've read everything, we've looked at all the arguments, and we're just going to put it in the, in the academic building, in, in the offices. It's just like, but, but, but that's the wrong choice. Um, it's, it's very interesting to me. I do know that I'm over time, but I don't know. I really have to listen to the physics person instead of the not physics person on this. The dynamite analogy isn't uncalled for. I have a really hard time with the Cavalier. Yeah, it's fine. Attitude about nuclear waste. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm just gonna quickly, very quickly, 
because, oh my gosh, there's so much stuff and I ran out of time. Um, but this one also, like, covered on the blog. So I, I was okay sort of putting it off. Um, the first article read like, those silly scientists and their worries with the helium liquefier, which is pro probably the most alarming place imaginable. <laughs> um, we have never been able to find a copy of what this uh, is an appendix to. We have multiple copies of this appendix. We have never located a copy of the report of the nuclear event of November 12, 1971. So this event took place uh, roughly three years before they decided to store nuclear waste in the physics building. I could not find a copy of the report. Uh, as far as we know, a copy of the report does not exist in any of the um, presidential or vice presidential papers that we have. Um, it's not in uh, like a any of the papers that we've received. Uh, I could not locate a copy of the report uh, on in the materials available online from the Nuclear Energy Commission, which at the time was the um, AEC, uh, and they would have received the report, but I couldn't find a copy there either. So I don't know. This appendix, though, just picks up with Jacobs asking Onega, Dr. Onega, will you give us your account of what happened both before and after the incident, which occurred approximately 3 p.m. on Friday afternoon? And so I will read part of this, and, and you'll get a sense. Um, there's definitely more of this uh, available on the blog post. I don't think I ever managed to get it fully um, OCR'd, uh, so I don't know if the full document is up there, but um, if somebody wants it, you know, comment on the post and it'll nudge me. Uh, <laughs> um, Onega. Bill and I, Bill Raymond and I, were in room 106, and the reason we were trying to do the experiment was because we were trying to measure the energy groups of the delayed neut neutron of U-235. Um, uh, that's what we were trying to do. We were trying to previous to this, do some calibration, and we had ordered some oxygen-18, and it was not really what we had ordered that came from Oak Ridge, only 8% enriched, and so we were getting null results. To determine whether to order more oxygen-18, which is fairly expensive, we decided that we'd make sure that we would have enough neutrons up there in room 106 to begin with uh, to do the experiment before we ran into any more expense. We had previously made an estimate of the amount that we should see, however. But in any case, we were getting ready to do this, and Bill Raymond said that he would have things pretty much ready whenever I got over there at 1.30 in the afternoon. Well, uh, whenever I got over there, he was going through the reactor startup, and I think he had asked Keith Furr to sign the reactor startup form, and then I see that he did. The form was shown to me at the Radiation Safety Committee meeting. So he was going through the checkup already and was starting up. For some reason or other, the reactor, I think scrammed down to begin with. And so I was preparing the sample. Uh, Bill and I had talked a little bit about this beforehand, so I put in approximately a gram. I think it's actually somewhat less than a gram of uh, U-235. It's 93% enriched in U-235. Um, <clears throat> we talked about how long we should irradiate it for. And we, uh, what was going through my mind, was to maximize the experimental situation. And since we were trying to measure the energy groups of these delayed neutrons and the longest lived group uh, has a half-life of about 55 seconds, we wanted to irradiate to maximize or to optimize the count rates. So that meant saturating the longest group, which would lead me into about a three minute irradiation time. That's how that came about. So Bill then filled out this form, the activation data form. He was wanting that filled out. So since he had just gotten a license, I assumed that he was familiar with all the details of these things. He asked me if I would sign the paper, and I thought that I was actually requesting the form. But you can see from this activation data form that I really signed the senior operator. Uh, a place where the senior operator authorized him to run uh, is to sign. But that was unknown to me, and the reason it was is because at that particular time, uh, Farouk 
uh, Alta Vila was in room 106 and we were talking about a problem that had come up in one of our courses and so Bill set this form in front of me and I signed it really without looking very closely at what I was signing and that was the reason I signed the I, I thought I was requesting the, the irradiation rather than doing the authorizing of the radiation in any case we put the sample in for three minutes and tried to pull the sample out this occurred at approximately 315 but we determined uh, but I think the activation the log actually says someone mentioned later to me it was 305 if I'm not mistaken. The scram was at 3.05. So it was actually then 3.02 when we put the sample in because it was there for precisely three minutes. <clears throat> After the three minutes were up, Bill attempted to bring the sample up and all the alarms went off. He had his civil defense meter there and I suggested he check the sample. Uh, see if he could see any activity, and I ran over to the reactor room. This was in room 106, where the experiment was being carried on, and the reactor console is in room 108. So I ran over there to find out if it was if it was serious, if it was real, or to see what the situation was. The alarm went on to begin with, as well as I recall, and then it went off, and then it came back on. After I went back to 106, uh, why, it seemed to me very shortly thereafter that Bob Stone came in, and Myers came in, and Keith came in, and Bill was in there, and I was in there. It was suggested that the sample be knocked loose. We could see that the sample didn't return, so I think that Keith suggested that we try to dislodge the sample, which was the reasonable suggestion. It seemed to me at that particular time to dislodge the sample by firing in another one. Uh, this is in the nuclear accelerator, the home-built nuclear accelerator, of course. Um, <clears throat> or possibly not. I mean, they had two accelerators at this time, so. Uh, we did that, and whenever we brought the sample back, it was, radio it was radioactive. It was very hot, and so when we discerned this, I think Bob Stone went out to get a lead container to put the hot radioactive sample in, and we fired it again, as I recall. Um, we fired the sample in twice in order to try to dislodge this and bring it back, and neither time did the original sample come back. The sample was then, the container to dislodge the original one was then taken out of the rabbit, uh, put into the lead container, as well as the end cap for the rabbit. Bill Raymond went in and got another lead container, in case we could get the original sample back, and he also got another end cap for the rabbit, which I think he got from room 17 from Fur's lab. We tried several times uh, <clears throat> to bring the sample back, but none of it was successful. Well, after we saw we weren't going to get it loose, Bob Stone, Cy Myers, Bill Raymond, and myself um, uh, took some survey meters, and we were trying to find out exactly where the sample was hung up. The sample was hung up right at the edge of the reactor shield itself. It was in the rabbit tubing right at the edge of the shield, and whenever we discerned exactly where it was, we got a screwdriver and disconnected the tubing there, taped the end shut, and also disconnected the tubing. Uh, the other end of this aluminum tube that the sample was in and taped that end shut. I handed the tube to Bob Stone, who was standing on the top of the hot cell, and he lowered the tube, with the sample in the tube, down into the hot cell where it still remains. Both ends of the remaining tubing were also sealed shut. At that particular time, we used battleship gray tape, several layers of that, as I recall. I guess I neglected to say that sometime previous to this, uh, the building had been uh, the. I guess I neglected to say that sometime previous to this, the building had been evacuated. I don't remember exactly what that time was. I estimate, uh, Bill and I estimated that the whole incident required perhaps from the time the sample, uh, from the time the building alarm went off originally until the sample was secured in the hot cell, uh, may have been about 20 minutes. Uh, but that is as good as we can estimate. During this time, I also had a pocket decimeter on, and during the whole business, I got 51 millirem of radiation. After the sample was secured, we th then we tried to discern exactly when the situation, or exactly what the situation was, and we saw that we did have a contamination problem. First lab was used to discern exactly whether fission fra fragments were scattered around or not, and it was discerned that they were. Keith had also previously called the AEC so that the AEC had a blow-by-blow -blow description of the whole situation as it was being carried on. Well, it was, uh, the AEC decided that Raymond and I should go down to the hospital just in case there should be any kind of radiation injected. Um, <clears throat> actually, Cy had swabbed our noses out with Q-tips to find out if we had inhaled any radiation, and I think mine was 12 times the background count and Bill's, Bill Raymond's was two times the background count. Well, we went down to the hospital, and that's essentially it. Like, that's the introduction to, to this um, appendix to a report. Um, like I said, it, this is featured on the, in, in the blog. Um, uh, so, 
it's definitely possible to, to read more if you're interested. Um, it, I would love to find the AEC report. They called the AEC, so there's definitely an AEC report, but I've never been able to find it, and I would love to see the actual report. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so yes, the nuclear event of November 12th, 1971, um, there was a essentially a malfunction in the um, nuclear accelerator, um, and there was some nuclear material spread around the physics building, uh, and some exposures, and some people went to the hospital. Um, uh, it was a minor mishap, but it was it was a thing. And then three years later, they were deciding, oh yeah, let's just store nuclear waste in the um, offices of the nuclear researchers in the physics building. And the combination of those two things together just, like, blows my mind. So... <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, the, the nuclear waste storage didn't make it into the blog post, but the, um, the nuclear event, I know that I specifically talk about it in there. Uh, so... Once again, I will point people towards that blog post if, if you want to learn more. Um, I think it's a fascinating topic. I'm amazed that um, we knew so little about it until I did this blog post. Um, like, we knew very little about the history of the nuclear power plant beyond the fact that tech used to have one. Um, uh, and I just I find it fascinating. Uh, and it was when I was looking for stuff for that blog post that I got interested in and discovered all of the high-energy physics materials in, in the archives. And that's why we did an entire series last year. Anyway, it is it is uh, well past time. I do need to um, be shutting down the stream because I do need to be heading home. Um, and there will be people waiting for me to pick them up. So, we need to figure out where we're going for a raid. Um... Let me look at the options. Oh dear. Da, 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 da. We have jelly cam, so Monterey is not necessarily where we want to be going. Um, hmm. There are not a whole lot of people uh, on our usual raid spot. Uh, I don't see that Steven is on. So um, it looks, though, like we could pop in on Bit Rebellious, uh, who is a relatively new streamer, but also somebody who has uh, hung out in the community a bit and uh, is, is a familiar name. Um, so we could pop in over there. Uh, why will this not scroll? <laughs> um, or I could... Potential, there's also, hello, it's Colo. Uh, we, or we could just not raid, or... Uh, I mean, Bit is on, and sure, we'll we'll show some support for a new streamer. Uh, so we're gonna pop in over on Bit Rebellious, uh, and they are. It looks like playing a game called While the Iron Is Hot. So, oh, it's doing where? Hello. Anyway, uh, thank you all so much for joining me uh, today. Um, of course, thank you, Eric, for the uh, raid. And um, next week, I might know what I have coming up. Oh, next week... 
is going to be interesting. Uh, next week, I have materials related to elections in Virginia. Not current elections. Historical elections in Virginia. So um, next week we'll be talking about the voting and elections in Virginia. Uh, so it should be interesting. Anyway, um, thank you so very much. Oh, that's why Steven's not on because of the time change. Another couple weeks and he'll be he'll be on again. Anyway, um, hopefully I will see all of you again soon. Uh, we'll be popping in over to Bit Rebellious's channel here in just just a, a tick. Um, so yeah. Thank you all for joining me. Hopefully I see you soon. Uh, and until I do, uh, keep exploring history, everybody. <laughs>